Well, thank you everybody for having me out. I appreciate it. I'm CBS 12. I'm the severe weather expert from CBS 12 down in West Palm Beach. I'm glad to be here. Glad to tell you that the forecasts for this hurricane season are less active than normal. Of course, we all know that it doesn't matter how active a hurricane season is, it really only takes one storm. And so you'll be hearing me say that at least a couple of times annoyingly uh, this morning. So thank you for having me out. I appreciate it. All right. Let's just uh, jump right in and talk about the last time a Category 5 hurricane hit. That was a long time ago, 1992. How long is that, 92? So it's been like almost, well, it's been a long time. It's been, what, 23 years? So it's been a long, long time since we've had a Category 5 hit. How many of you were here, by the way, during uh, Hurricane Andrew? At least a few people. How many of you were in Miami-Dade during Hurricane Andrew? You were in Miami, so at least a couple of you. Where, were you guys in Homestead or Coral, Coral Gables? You were in Miami Beach? So, and Donna, wow, that's, he's been here a long time. I was baby. Yeah, I can tell, you must have been. Um, so, how many of you were down in Homestead to see the damage during Hurricane Andrew? So you've seen the damage in Hurricane Andrew. Uh, I imagine that was quite a devastating sight to see. Uh, one of the scariest things that you hear people say is that once they came back, they couldn't even locate their block because there were no signs, there were no trees, there were no landmarks, there was no way of knowing which street they lived on. I've heard that from a lot of people. By the way, I used to work in Miami at a CBS affiliate down in Miami for about six years before I came here. Okay. Uh, now. This, of course, we remember just a couple of years ago. Sandy, back in 2012. Now, I'm a New Yorker. I I'm, I'm, was born and raised in New York City. And, of course, the people in New York will swear to you that that was a major hurricane. But you know what? It actually technically wasn't even a hurricane when it came on shore. How many of you knew that that wasn't a hurricane when it came on shore? So the National Hurricane Center had changed the classification of the storm right before it made landfall to no longer a tropical system. And as you can imagine, that created a tremendous amount of problems with the insurance industry, because all of a sudden it was no longer a hurricane. But at the same time, there's billions of dollars worth of damage there. In any event, Sandy was really the strength of a category one hurricane. But what's interesting about Sandy is it brought with it the storm surge of what would be about a category three storm plus. And that's because it was such a big storm and that's one thing that we know about hurricanes is the bigger they are, and no two hurricanes are alike, but generally speaking, the bigger they are, the more storm surge that they produce if you're looking at it in terms of the same amount of wind. Okay. All right, we remember this storm. How many of you were here during Wilma back in 2005? How many of you were without power during Wilma in 2005? And how many of you lost power for more than a week? Okay, how many of you lost power for two weeks in Wilma? Two weeks. Lucky you, you're the winner. Well, okay, it's not really a win, but anyway, one of the things when it comes to hurricanes that concerns me the most is Yes, obviously the hurricane itself is life-threatening, but afterwards can be life-threatening because here you are without air conditioning for two weeks. Now, Wilma luckily hit at the very end of the season when it wasn't as hot anymore, at the end of October. But hurricanes around here hit in July, August, September, the heat of the season. How would you feel if you were out without uh, air conditioning for two weeks? and without the amenities that you are used to. Maybe you don't have clean water. Maybe you can't take a shower at home. It's possible. Okay, so I just wanted to show you the cycle, and I'm gonna to try to use this pointer here to show it to you. Uh, this goes from, this graph you see, goes from 1900 all the way up to about 2010. And as you can see, back here in the 1940s and 1950s, by the way, the red is hurricanes, and the blue is all named tropical storms. As you can see, back in the 1940s, there was a large amount of storms. It was a lot more active, and you can kind of see how it goes up, 
down, up, down, and then back up again. Obviously, up until a couple of years ago, it's been very active. We've been in a very active cycle. And you can see this uptick during the year 2001 and 2008. So there is a cycle, by the way, in hurricanes. We call it the multi-decadal oscillation. And I'm going to talk more about that in a couple of seconds. All right, this we've probably all seen before, right? Which shows you when, oh, hold on, okay. Which shows you when it becomes more active. And you can see that the statistical peak of the hurricane season is September. Things really start to ramp up around here, around August 1st, and then we really start to see a lot of activity around August 15th. Uh, we can see storms before that, but believe it or not, as you can see, we actually tend to see slightly more activity in June than we do in July. I wonder if anybody knows the reason why we might see a little bit more activity in June. Anybody have a, a gander or a guess at why that would be the case? Hold on. What's your name? Uh, Mario Price. Okay. Uh, I'm speculating change of seasons, winds. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Uh, during June, we still have fronts that are coming down from the north. Those fronts tend to get stuck in the Gulf of Mexico because it's no longer cold enough to push the fronts all the way through Florida. So they get stuck in the tropics and they fester and they fester and they form into these hybrid subtropical, you've heard of subtropical systems. So during June, we tend to get those kind of on the edge of tropical storm systems and you get them more often because you still have those wintertime fronts coming down. By July, you no longer have wintertime fronts making it into the Gulf, and so that ends up being a little bit of a tiny bit of a tiny bit of a lull, and then things really ramp up once we get into the pure tropical season. Okay, all right, this is going to be hard to see, but this gives you an idea of the total uh, hurricane strikes, so hurricane force winds per county since 1900. And let me see if I can get this right. Palm Beach County is around 18. And St. Lucie County is around 16, I believe. That's what, that's what that says, 16. And obviously the highest is down in Monroe County, which would be the Keys. And that's somewhere, well, I can't read that. 20 something, but it's, it's up there. So we get hit by more hurricanes than anywhere else in the United States, right here in South Florida. A little less as you head up here, but still it's a lot. Okay, this is the return period. Again, you know, this looked better on my computer. I think we're losing a little resolution here. But the return period of storms, as you can see, from Palm Beach County down to Miami is between five and seven years. So we typically see hurricane force winds every five to seven years on average in South Florida. When was the last time we had hurricane force winds here? 2005, 2005? That's Wilma. So we are on a major hurricane drought. It has been 10 full years since we have seen hurricane force winds in South Florida. All right, this is the return period for a major hurricane. And as you can see, uh, all of South Florida is under this red, so our return period is somewhere around 15 to 20 years. So every 15 to 20 years, we tend to see a major hurricane, and a major hurricane is a category three, a category four, or a category five. Okay, now this is very interesting. We have set a record. We have a record-breaking drought since a major hurricane has made landfall in the United States. That is Hurricane Wilma. Wilma was the last major hurricane to make landfall in the United States. We have gone 3,500 plus days so it's, some, it's somewhere around 35, 10, or 15 or something now. Uh, this was based on the beginning of the hurricane season. But that is the graph, that is the line. The old record is that, which is somewhere around 2,200 days in between major landfalling hurricanes in the United States. So that's just how much of a drought we have seen. It didn't seem like a drought was possible back in 2004 and 2005. I mean, think about that statistically. 2004 and 2005, two of the busiest seasons, we got clobbered with storm. How many of you were here during 2004, 2005? It was scare, scary times. Francis and Jean, weeks, weeks away from each other right here. Then all of a sudden we go 10 years, we don't have a hurricane. 
that hits the state of Florida. All right, uh, this uh, you probably have heard before, but let me show you the statistics when it comes to deaths that are caused by hurricanes. Most of it is caused by water. You might think that winds are the most dangerous part of a hurricane. Typically though, people protect themselves in homes and structures that are safe or fairly safe from hurricanes. But they underestimate how much damage rain and storm surge can do. Most of it is done in storm surge and we saw that with Hurricane Sandy. Sandy caused most of its deaths due to storm surge. People in New York City, they had no idea that Manhattan could be under 10 feet of water. They didn't even know it was possible because it's never happened in their lifetime. They had absolutely no reference point whatsoever. Us as meteorologists, we knew it was gonna happen. We saw in Sandy a storm that was unlike any storm we had seen, which was a storm that was gonna come at the coast like that. It was just gonna hook directly into the coast. And when you look at the shoreline of New York City and New Jersey, how many of you are from New York City and New Jersey? Exactly, so this is like the fifth or sixth borough, this is the sixth borough of New York City. I'm from New York City myself, so I know there's a lot of people from up north. If you look at the coastline of New Jersey and Long Island, you can see why a storm that comes in at this angle would force all the water right into the crevice of Raritan Bay. Raritan Bay is where New York City, New Jersey, and Long Island all come together. And so that's why Staten Island and Manhattan had 10 to 12 feet of water, and that's why so many people lost their lives due to storm surge. Couldn't have possibly thought in New York City, they couldn't have thought it, but certainly it was something that we saw coming for a long time. Now they know, now they have a point of reference. Uh, all right, so I just wanted to talk about some of the new products that are coming out from the National Hurricane Center. This one is experimental. They realize how important storm surge forecasting and warning is. Up until this point, they issue a hurricane warning, but they have not come up with a product for storm surge warnings. So this year, they are experimenting with, it won't go into production until next year or the year after, but they're experimenting with this right here. It's a prototype storm surge warning and storm surge watch. So if we were to get a hurricane this year in our area, we would then pass this along. They would be issuing these experimental storm surge warnings and storm surge watches in the orange. Just to let you know that you're in an area where you can potentially see life-threatening storm surge. Uh, this is a new product from 2014, which I wanted to go over. We didn't really have a very active season last year, so it wasn't used very much. But if a storm landfalls, the National Hurricane Center, every time they run a, a forecast suite, so every time they issue an advisory, they're going to put one of these out. They're going to have their computer model run and say, okay, we think a storm is heading right into Fort Myers. This is Fort Myers. If the storm takes this track, what is the reasonable worst case scenario? Reasonable worst case scenario of how much storm surge there could be. So they will run this product and then we, as the media, will put this out on television and on the web and show you the areas in red are areas where we could see over nine feet of storm surge. So, and, and that's, I think it misrepresents it to some degree. It's nine feet above the ground where you stand. And that's another product that they, that they started putting out last year, which is for a while they were only uh, giving you two days notice. They were saying storms, storm formation is not, is not expected in the next 48 hours. Now they're predicting storm uh, formation is not expected in the next five days. So they've, they've extended that, and they've also given you an idea of where they think it's gonna form. So if the disturbance is located there, they're saying, we think it'll form three, four, five days out, and we think it's gonna form in that area. Okay, so that, that helps everybody out a little more. Okay, so let's talk about what we expect this season. First of all, this is kind of a wide view. There's, by the way, the United States right there in South America. So let's look at the water temperatures. In the Gulf of Mexico, in the Bahamas, water temperatures are slightly above normal, so maybe a half a degree or a degree. That means that there's a little bit more energy available close to home, a little bit more energy available in our neck of the woods. 
So if a storm forms in the Gulf, the storm forms in the Bahamas, it would have a little more energy. But at the same time, we see there's a lot of cool water right here in the Southern Caribbean. I like to see that. Water temperatures are below normal in the Caribbean. So the end result is close to home at least, we have kind of a mixed situation. Obviously the warmer the water, the more fuel there is to fuel hurricanes. Okay. Turns out that the Atlantic sea surface temperatures are very cool. I mean, this is the coolest signatures I've, signature I've seen in a long, long time. So water temperatures in the Atlantic right now are well below normal. And, you know, and I'm going to get back to this in a second, but this, we think, as a meteorological community, could be the beginning of a less active 20-year cycle in hurricanes. Because we saw this last year, and we see it even more this year. What's happening is, there's a certain area up here uh, that determines the water temperatures. We have an area of high pressure right there. The stronger it is, the more that it allows cool water to seep in. Remember, high pressure has a clockwise wind flow. And around the basin, you tend to have a flow like this anyway. The basin flows like this, the water. So we're getting water from the northern Atlantic seeping down the west side of Europe and then out into the tropical Atlantic. And that is lowering water temperatures and limiting or theoretically limiting the number of hurricanes that form in the East Atlantic. That's good. We like that. Here's another good sign for us. The Pacific is mighty hot right now. In fact, it's one of the hottest springs on record for water temperatures in the Pacific. Does anybody know what warm waters in the Pacific mean? Do, say it all at once. One, two, three. El Nino. Yes, El Nino. Uh, so this is not just your grandmother's El Nino. This is, could be one of the strongest El Ninos we have ever seen taking place, and we're starting to see some aspects of that. All that flooding in Texas, well, somewhat related to El Nino. And it's only getting stronger. It's predicted to get much stronger, as I'm about to show you. In fact, here it is. I am about to show you. So this is, OK, kind of difficult. But every one of these lines represents a different computer model. Every line represents a slightly different computer model. Now, you probably have heard us mention on the news we have all these computer models. Well, individual agencies run their own physics models to kind of model the forecast of the atmosphere out two days, three days, 10 days, in some cases, one, two, three months. So all these models represent different universities, different governments. Some are the UK. We also have the Japanese Meteorological Agency here. We have our own United States forecast models. We have universities that run their computer models. They all have slightly different physics. They all have slightly different initial conditions. And they run these gigantic computer models and try to forecast what's going to happen in the future. So, each one of these lines represents a different computer model. Right here is zero degrees Celsius. This line right here is the sea surface temperature anomaly. Anomaly just meaning how different is it than what it should be? How different than normal is it? So this is zero. We're starting out here. So when these computer models ran, the water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean were about 0.6 degrees Celsius above normal. Well, all the computer models, for the most part, except a couple, strengthen it. The average is somewhere around here. Now, our best computer model is that one right there, the ECMWF. That is the European computer model. This is run in the United Kingdom. It is really our best computer model. I use it almost exclusively for my forecast. And this one actually shows an almost, if not record-breaking, El Nino up here, showing water temperatures at 2.5 degrees above normal by September, October, and November. So that's when the models are calling for the peak in this El Nino, somewhere in the fall, late fall. Okay. So the stronger the El Nino, uh, typically the less hurricanes we see in the Atlantic Basin. All right, 
This now is somewhat similar to what I just showed you. I promise it's going to get less technical in a second. Uh, this is only the European model, but it's variations of the European model. So what they've done, they, they said, okay, we're going to run the European model 50 times. And we're going to change the physics in it 50 times. We're going to tweak the physics in every time we run it. And when we run it, we're going to get all different solutions for where we think the El Nino is going to go. So these are 50 different solutions or so to, the, uh, to what, how strong they think El Nino is going to be. Take a look at that blue dot right there. Do you guys see those, Do you guys see those blue dots right in the middle, right there? That was the 1997 El Nino. That was the strongest El Nino on record. 60% of the European ensemble members predict that this year is going to be stronger than the strongest El Nino ever. It gives you an idea of how robust predictions are for El Nino, which is also somewhat good for us. We want a strong El Nino. We want a strong El Nino because the stronger the El Nino is, the stronger the jet stream is above. And the stronger the jet stream is above, the more wind shear you have to tear these hurricanes apart. So that's what El Nino does for us. It causes stronger winds in the upper part of the atmosphere and it tears thunderstorms apart to some degree. And you need a very calm environment for hurricanes to form. Hurricanes do not like a tumultuous environment to form. They are tumultuous, but they like to be left alone. They want to be in their own space. And when there is a disturbance like El Nino causing strong winds, it does not allow them to form. Okay, so this is kind of a re re reiteration of what I was talking about. This is Mexico right here, hot water, El Nino. Now if you look at the averages, um, we average about 9.4 named storms during an El Nino, we average about seven. Hurricanes, we average about six. Hurricanes, during an El Nino, we average about four. Forget about the Eastern Pacific, it doesn't really affect us. Actually, they get more hurricanes during an El Nino. It makes sense, the water temperature is warmer. So, here's kind of a diagram of how that works. So during an average year, your, your winds aloft, your wind shear are weak, and so thunderstorms grow directly upward. During an El Nino, your thunderstorms get tilted to the side. And because of that tilting, it doesn't allow these hurricanes to form, or if it does, they don't get as strong, typically. Okay. And you can see the result. El Nino, there are a lot less storms. This is in El Nino, all the storms since 1925. And as you can see, there are a lot less lines there. During a neutral year, or a La Nina year, you can see lines cover all of the Gulf of Mexico, all of the state of Florida. There's less during El Nino. However, what I will say is, Betsy, Hurricane Betsy and Camille, two of the strongest hurricanes we've ever had, have been during El Nino years. So just because you have less hurricanes doesn't mean that you're not going to have strong hurricanes or impactful hurricanes. Because what really matters is, does a hurricane hit a populated area? Here is the forecast from Colorado State, the new updated forecast, which was issued on June 1st. They're now saying that we're going to have eight named storms. The average is 12. They are saying we're going to have three hurricanes. The average is 6.5. And they're saying we're going to have one major hurricane, and the average is two. So clearly they're saying what everybody else is saying, which this should be a weaker than normal season. Okay. Now, this is a little bit more technical, and I told you I would come back to this. But this is called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. And the question here is, is it weakening? Is it waning? By looking at this graph, you can clearly see that there is a pattern in the Atlantic Ocean. By the way, the, uh, the orange and the uh, red that you see, those are warmer water temperatures. And the blue you see are cooler water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. So you can clearly see back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, we were in a cycle, and that's important because this is a cycle. We were in a warming cycle, and during this time, if you remember the graph I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, we had a lot of hurricanes. Then in the 1970s and 80s, and 90s, the beginning of the 90s, we had a lot less hurricanes. 
and it was corresponding to this right here, which is a weakening, uh, you know, a weakening of this cycle and uh, cooler water temperatures in the Atlantic. Then, over the past 10 to 15 years, we've had warm water in the Atlantic and thus a lot of hurricane activity. Very active. One of the most active cycles we've ever had have occurred from the mid-90s through essentially the time we got Wilma. So I just remind you that even though all these factors are true and that we may be entering a weaker cycle that could last 20 years, instead of seeing 15 storms per year, we will see eight storms per year. It doesn't matter. Back in 1992, we had Hurricane Andrew. And in 1992, we were in a weak cycle and we still had one of the most devastating hurricanes that we've ever had, which was a category five hurricane in a season when there were only seven named storms. So I always say this, it's so true. It doesn't matter if we have a weak, quiet season. It really only takes one storm. And you hear us say that all the time, and it's kind of cliche, but if it impacts you, if it's the one storm and it impacts the populated area, um, then it matters. Okay, you know, obviously, um, I could go and tell you how much water you need and how you need to have batteries and how you should have a radio. I don't want to do that because we've all heard that a gajillion times living in the state of Florida. But some things that I, I thought were maybe a little off the beaten path, in case for whatever reason your water supply is contaminated and you need clean drinking water, uh, water purification tablets are a good idea. Uh, one of the meteorologists at my old station in Miami had this. He had a bathtub liner. So it was essentially a plastic bathtub liner that he put, that he, he lined the bathtub with and then just put a hose and water into it and filled the whole bathtub up. So you're not just putting water into the bathtub. If you put it in the bathtub, it's going to kind of get dirty, so you really can't drink it. Uh, you put it into the liner, and then you can actually use it for drinking water or whatever you might need it for. Um, this, you know, we tell you all the time, but this is so important. Make sure you seal up and take with you all your valuable documents, like your insurance, like your ID, whatever you might need. Make sure you have it. Pictures that you don't want to lose. Um, you might need ID to get back to your house. Um, I lived on Miami Beach when I lived in Miami and I worked about a half hour away on the mainland and if I didn't have my ID, they weren't going to let me back on the island during a hurricane. So make sure you have your ID. I think that's it. Okay. So for more information, you can download our hurricane guide, cbs12.com. I think we also have a table in the back if you want to check us out. Alright, with that said, are we good? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.